Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the first three verses is where I direct your attention in the Word of God this morning. And on this first Sunday of the new year, bringing this message to our church family that I believe the Lord laid on my heart for us as we continue as a church family to fulfill our two-word motto into 2020, traveling light. You don't have to walk very far around our church. Out here in the foyer will you see it. Up in uh, the lighthouse you will see it wherever you go. There, the ladies of the church have placed those two words prominently as they have designed them in certain key places to remind us as a church family that during this time, during this time of transition, during this time in our church life, what we are doing is traveling light. We continue that theme this morning from Hebrews chapter 12 and the first three verses. I have to admit these are some of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. I love preaching from Hebrews. All of you know that. I love preaching from Hebrews 12 verses 1, 2, and 3. When I was a teenager in church, Shortly before God called me to preach, I memorized these verses and have enjoyed them, been blessed by them, have sought to live by them all of my Christian life. Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3, church family, hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and laying aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter, the author and the finisher of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured that cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and give up and lose heart. Three years ago next month, I convinced myself to run in the... Fort Worth Cowtown Marathon. Actually, I didn't convince myself to run the full marathon, 26.2 miles. That would have been way beyond my caliber and ability. But I did run in the half marathon, 13.1 miles. I can't believe it. It's the longest distance I've ever run in all of my life. But I committed myself to do it. I did the training up till that point in time. And I was so proud of myself when on that very cold February morning, I stepped off the starting line when the gun went off, and there I was running in the Cowtown Half Marathon. Now all those professional long-distance runners, you know, amateur and professionals that were running the marathon, I didn't worry about them too much. They had already left before the rest of us in the Half Marathon did, and that was perfectly fine. But I want you to know that I got on that track and began to run that 13.1 miles. And about halfway down the, through that, that uh, distance, I began to feel it. I mean everything from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, every nerve fiber and millibar of my being throbbed with pain. I thought my lungs were going to burst out of my chest. I thought my legs were going to turn into rubber. I wasn't sure I could make it. But finally, finally, I crossed that finish line and I finished that race. You know, uh, the Bible, in this particular place, the author of Hebrews compares the Christian life to a long-distance race. The marathon race, 26.2 miles, is a long-distance race. Been famous since the days of the Olympic Games centuries ago. And the author of Hebrews says, you know, that's a good analogy, that's a good picture, that's a good example of what it means to be a Christian. It is to run the Christian's marathon. 
From the moment you are saved to the moment God calls you home to be with Him, you're on the track, you're in the race. And therefore the author says in these verses that we are to run with endurance the race that is set before us. There are lessons from these verses to our church family. Listen carefully with your church ears this morning. And listen carefully with your personal and individual Christian ears this morning to hear from these three verses what God the Holy Spirit will say to you individually and what He will say to our church family. Appropriate it is that the long distance race would be compared to the Christian life. Because you see, the long distance race is characterized by a number of things. For one, the long distance race is characterized by some pain. It hurts to run long distance races. There is pain that is involved. Interestingly enough, the very Greek word in your text for the word race here is the Greek word agon. We get an English word that we borrow from that Greek word agon. That English word is agony. Because anybody who's ever run long distance races knows it is agony, it hurts, it is painful, it is difficult. And of course the obvious lesson there that we can draw applicationally to us as Christians, when we live the Christian life, when we serve the Lord, we have to keep on keeping on, we cannot quit, and it is not easy. Joshua didn't invade Canaan in a rocking chair, and we don't go to heaven on flowery beds of ease. To live for Jesus is difficult. It always has been, it always will be. It doesn't matter whether you're a student, a teenager, whether you're a senior adult, or anybody in between. To walk with Christ, to live for Christ, to make the commitment and the decision to keep on the track and to continually run no matter what winds fight you, no matter what rains come symbolically in your life, no matter how many hills, no matter how many potholes, no matter how many times you fall, yes, The Christian life is characterized by some spiritual pain, but we keep going. It's also characterized, a race is characterized by progress. The point of a race is there's a starting line and there's a finish line. The gun goes goes off, the runners begin to run, and what do they do? They make progress. The key word in the Christian life this morning is not the word perfection. Perfection is where you are headed. That's where God will bring you when He brings you to heaven. He's going to clean us all up. He's going to deal with all sin in our lives. We've already been saved from the penalty of sin. We are daily being saved from the power of sin. And one day we will ultimately be saved from the very presence of sin as we have a glorified body in heaven for all of eternity. Perfection is in your future. But the key word in the Christian life today is not the word perfection. It is the word progression. What God is concerned about is that you as a church, we as a church, you individually as a Christian, that you are making progress spiritually, putting one spiritual foot in front of another foot spiritually, and that you are progressing. Are you at a level three on spiritual maturity? This year, 2020, God wants you to go to a four. Are you at a level six? This year in 2020, God wants you to move to a level seven. Wherever you are, God does not want you to regress spiritually. He wants you to progress spiritually. He wants you to make progress. And that's what this author is talking about in this great passage of Scripture. Another characteristic of a race is direction. When you run the race, you have to run in the right direction. You have to compete according to the rules. If you run out of bounds, you are disqualified. Direction is vital. It happened in 1928 when Southern California played Georgia Tech in the Rose Bowl. And on that day, there was an event that occurred that made sports history. There was a fumble on the field, and a man by the name of Roy Regals picked up the ball. He began to run. It was a magnificent run. It was a beautiful run. In fact, it was the best run of the day, but finally, Roy Regals was tackled by his own teammates just short of his own goal line because in all of the confusion of the fumble, he had picked up the ball and he ran in the wrong direction. He earned a nickname that carried with him all through his life. They called him Wrong Way Regal. You know, I wonder if God ever looks down from heaven on Sunnyvale Baptist Church 
And he looks over there and he says, shaking his head, there goes old wrong way John. There goes old wrong way Susan. There goes old wrong way Bill. There goes old wrong way Tammy. Always running off in the wrong direction. No, if we are going to live the Christian life, the way God intends us to live. And if it is, as it were, a race, we've got to run in the right direction, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Well, these are some of the characteristics of the race. Let's look and see what God himself says directly to us about what this race is and how we are to run it. If you look carefully at these verses, you will discover that the main point, the main thing God wants you to see in these verses is found in the single one imperative that's in the verse. And it is found at the end of verse 1, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It is a command, it's not an option. Every one of us is a runner on the track. None of us can choose to go off, climb off the track onto the, into the stands and watch others run. No, we have to run. It is the race, notice the author says, that is lying before us. It has been given to us by God. The moment of your salvation, you entered the Christian's marathon. And you're on the track, and you are running the race, and we must run with endurance this race that God has given to us. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to live the Christian life. The, the author is comparing your Christian life and our life corporately as a church to a long distance race. Now, when you are sprinting the 100 yard dash and when you are stealing second base in baseball, speed is important. But in the marathon, speed is less important. What is important, what is most important, is endurance. And hence the author says, let us run with endurance this race that is set before us. That's the main point. This is the driving point of the passage. But then the author says, now there are three things you need to know and do in order to run successfully. All three are given to us, articulated by participial phrases that modify the main verb here. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How do I run? Well, the author says, number one, you run seeing that you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Run with endurance the race set before us. Well, David, who in the world are those cloud of witnesses? Is that cloud of witnesses? Who are those people. A cloud of witnesses, that's an unusual phrase. A cloud in the sky, a large cloud. This is being used metaphorically here to symbolize a large group of people. Well, David, who is this cloud? Who, are, who comprise this cloud of witnesses? I know the answer to that, David. This would be my grandfather, who was a godly man and who taught me so much, and now he's gone to heaven, and he's on, in heaven, and he's watching me as I live the Christian life. This is my godly mother, my godly father. This is my Sunday school teacher, my pastor who's gone on to heaven, who led me to the Lord, or this is some such person as that. They are the cloud of witnesses. Now, whether those who've gone on ahead of us to heaven are watching and aware of what we're doing down here, I have no clue, and neither do you, because the Bible doesn't say. They may be or they may not be, but it's immaterial either way, because I can tell you this, that's not what the passage means. What the passage means, this cloud of witnesses, notice the word therefore that begins the verse and begins the chapter. And notice that the author is in the previous chapter, chapter 11, has given us God's great hall of fame of faith. And there's a listing of the names of great men and women, godly men and women of the Old Testament who lived by faith and who are witnesses. They are the cloud of witnesses. They bear witness that this is the way you succeed. This is how you run the race. This is what God expects. And so you go back to Hebrews 11 and you read those names. By faith, Enoch, and by faith, Noah, and by faith, Abraham, and by faith, Sarah, and by faith, you get all these names ending with, and by faith, Rahab. And so you get a listing of great men and women who were known for their faith. Now what's interesting is not a one of them was perfect, 
In fact, some of them had great failures in their lives recorded in the Old Testament, and yet the author of Hebrews says they were men and women of faith. And they are the witnesses. They endured. They kept running. They didn't quit. They didn't give up. And therefore, now the author says to his readers, and by extension to you and me today, those great men and women of the past who have lived for Christ, they are your examples. Others have run the race. You must run too. You're not running alone. Others have run and others are running with you. And this is what the author means when he says, we have this large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Others have done this. Therefore, let us run with endurance the race set before us. However, it is not inappropriate by analogy to point out that the application here is not only to those great men and women listed in Hebrews 11, but by analogy, we can make application in each of our individual lives to great men and women whose influence in our lives, who spoke into our lives, and whose testimony to us gave evidence and gives evidence continually. Though they've gone, they've gone on to their heavenly reward, yet we stand on their shoulders. I think about Miss Bishop. Little diminutive Miss Bishop couldn't have been five feet nothing, certainly not more than that. Second grade Sunday school teacher, fourth grade Sunday school teacher, my fourth grade Sunday school teacher at West Rome Baptist Church in Rome, Georgia. I remember in Ms. Bishop's class, oh, she was a dedicated lady. I remember one Sunday, I, we were walking out, Sunday school was over, we were getting ready to go to big church. She pulled me aside at the door, and she said, David, she said, I believe God has a plan for your life. I'm not sure what it is, but I suspect he's going to call you to preach. And she said, son, I want you to know that I have been praying for you, and I want you to know that from this day forward, I'm going to call your name before God every day in prayer. Well, I went on out to big church. You know, you're in the fourth grade and playing Little League Baseball, and you're beginning to get interested in girls. And so, well, yeah, that's sweet. Bless little Miss Bishop. She's a sweet little lady. November the 18th, 1973, at the age of 16, in a Sunday night service, God confirmed in my life that he was calling me to preach. And I came forward that night and I told my preacher, and he had me stand, he informed the church and let the people come by to pray for me. And after the service, in the line stepped Miss Bishop, a little older, a little grayer. She reached out, gripped my hand, looked up at me, and she said, Son, do you remember that day when you were in my class in the fourth grade? And I told you God was going to use you and do something special in your life? And I said, yes, ma'am, I do remember that. She said, son, from that day until this day, every day I have called your name out in prayer before our Heavenly Father. Well, next year, graduated from high school, or two years later, 1975, turned the nose of my Ford Maverick into the western wind, took Horace Greeley's advice, go west, young man, to a place called Dallas, Texas. And from 1975 in college, later seminary, marriage, and everything else, uh, pastoring two, two churches and so forth. But every year, going back home to visit family, I'd see Miss Bishop, a little older, a little grayer. She would find me in church, and she would come up and grip my hand. Son, do you remember that day when you were 16 years old, when you said God called you to preach? Yes, ma'am. She said, son, from that day until this day, not a single day has gone by that I have not called your name out in prayer before our Heavenly Father. It's been many years now since Ms. Bishop stepped into eternity. Many years. But I wouldn't trade the prayers of Ms. Bishop for all of the money in the world. Because as I stand before you this morning, I'm standing on her shoulders. She was a woman of faith. She is, as it were, in God's hall of fame of faith. She's a part of the cloud of witnesses. She ran that race, and she didn't quit. And so I'm aware of this great cloud of witnesses. You have people in your life you have influencers from your family, from your church years back, maybe a pastor, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe a, a friend, maybe a coach in school, 
maybe a teacher in school, whatever the case may be, there are those and you stand on their shoulders today. We are running this race because we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses upon whose shoulders we stand. But number two, the author says, let us run with endurance the race, laying aside, here's the second participial phrase, clause, laying aside every weight, every hindrance, and the sin, singular, that so easily entangles us. Have you discovered how difficult it is to run when you are encumbered about with something? Have you ever discovered how hard it is to run if you're wearing a lot of clothing, a lot of heavy clothing, or a lot of tight-fitting clothing, how hard it is to run? Runners in the early days of the Olympic Games would run virtually naked. They would come into the stadium with long, flowing, colorful robes, and all the people would have their favorite runners, just like today, that they would cheer and then as they got ready to run the race, they would discard those robes, and many would run in nothing but a little, sh little pair of what we would call like a pair of shorts, and some would run totally naked in order so that they would not be impeded by any bit of clothing or anything that would hinder them while they would run the long-distance race. The author says in that same vein that we are to run laying aside anything that will hinder traveling light. We started talking about this as a church back, in last, back last August, traveling light. Getting rid of, throwing off, casting aside anything, any attitude, any mindset, any habit, anything that will hinder us from running successfully the race. That has not changed. This is our goal. This is our mindset. This is our goal as a church family. This is our goal individually to run with endurance this race that is set before us by casting aside the phrase, the word in Greek is a strong word. It means to litter the racetrack with anything that would impede your progress. When I ran at Cowtown Marathon three years ago, February, it was a frigid day. I mean, it was freezing out there at 7.30 in the morning. We got out there to get started, and it was cold. But it was one of those typical Texas days. It started out really cold, but then about 9.30, it was warming up pretty good. And so I discovered as I was running, of course, all the big runners had gone before our group, you know, and then they release you by age. And, you know, so I was at that point, I was in my late 50s, and so I'm with all the, the late 50s group, you know. And so by the time we got halfway through our 13.1 mile half marathon, I began to notice discarded articles of clothing all across, all in gutters, on streets, because, I mean, there were thousands of people that ran in this race. There were T-shirts, and there were sweaters, and there were scarves, and there were gloves, and there were all kinds of stuff. In fact, I was later told by people that work in the sanitation that every year in Fort Worth, after the marathon, they have to go through those streets to pick up tons of discarded clothes. Because people start out running and then it warms up and they realize that's hindering them and so they throw off stuff. <laughs> and there's no place to put it. You know, they just throw it off. That's the word that's used here. When you're living for Christ, when you're serving the Lord in your Christian life and God the Holy Spirit reveals a habit, an attitude, thoughts, words, deeds that are inconsistent with the gospel, what should you do? You do what we used to say in North Georgia, what my grandfather would say, you get shed of it. You throw it off. You cast it aside. So, lots of us have cast a lot of stuff aside the last six months. That's good. But what else needs to be cast aside? What else needs to be thrown out? What else needs to be discarded as we run with endurance this race? And he also says not only every weight, but he says that sin that easily entangles us. Now notice the word sin there is singular. Could that be a reference to people's pet sin? Everybody has a pet sin. They have a hard time 
extricating themselves from. And maybe that could be the reference. Well, it could be, but I think more likely in the context of Hebrews 11, the whole point here is living by faith. And I think the sin that easily entangles every Christian, the sin that every Christian has to fight, is the sin of unbelief. Because in Hebrews, when you study the book of Hebrews carefully, as we are doing on Wednesday nights, by the way, if you don't have anything to do at 6.30 on Wednesday nights, we're teaching through the book of Hebrews. So we'll be coming through <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 14, starting next Wednesday night. Come join us. And you will discover that in the book of Hebrews, lack of faith is a synonym for disobedience. To, to be a Christian who chooses to walk by sight and not by faith, that's an act of disobedience. The, the author of Hebrews says, chapter 11, guess what? Without faith, it is unlikely to please God. Without faith, it is difficult to please God. No. What does the author of Hebrews say? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You have to have a certain element of faith, not just to become a Christian. Of course, we begin the Christian life by faith, but the point of Hebrews is you continue by faith. Every moment of every day, from this day till God calls you home, you have to live by faith. We need to make sure that we do not allow the sin of a lack of faith which results in disobedience, which easily ensnares all of us. Make sure that we walk by faith. This is what it's all about. So what do we need to get rid of? Any unbelief, any habits, anything. Even if it's not sinful, it may just be derogatory. It may be deprecatory, may be difficult, may be hindering you from your run, from your race. Whatever that is, you've got to get rid of it. Get it out of your life. And so the author has those two things to say. Then he comes to the main point. Let us with endurance run the race that lies before us. Now look at this. Did you notice when I read the text <clears throat> that in verses 1, 2, and 3 there is one word that is repeated in each verse. It occurs in verse 1, it occurs in verse 2, and it occurs again in verse 3. What is the word? Ah, it is the word endurance. Endurance. The point of running the race is we are to run with endurance. If you could read this in the Greek New Testament, you would discover that the word endurance, the phrase with endurance, is put first in the sentence. So it literally reads like this. With endurance, let us run the race that is set before us. This is the author's way of focusing on endurance. It's the author's way of emphasizing that the way you are to run this race to live successfully the Christian life is you've got to endure. So many Christians want to give up when going gets tough. They don't want to see it through. <clears throat> they don't want to stick it through. A little bit of problem comes their way. Difficulties come. And they don't remain faithful. They don't endure. But the author says we need to run with endurance the race that lies before us. It was a big day in 1983 in Australia. We're hearing a lot about Australia in the news. It was a big day in 1983 in Australia when the ultra marathon was about to be run. At the time, the longest distance race on planet Earth. It was called the Ultra Marathon. It was a race from Sydney, Australia to Melbourne, Australia, a distance of 547.3 miles. It was the longest race called the Ultra Marathon. Professional runners, long distance runners, converged on Sydney to participate in the ultra marathon on the day of the race. Those runners were there. They had all gotten their numbers they were wearing. The media was there. Crowds were there to see the race. Because obviously in a 547.3 mile race, you don't run that in a day or two days. It takes several days to do that. And so arriving close to the starting time, there was an old man 62 years of age, wearing overalls, 
wearing galoshes. Potato farmer and sheep herder in Australia named Cliff Young. Cliff Young walked up to the registration desk and requested a number to run in the race. They looked him, at him from top to bottom, disheveled, wearing overalls, wearing galoshes. And they began to laugh. They thought it was a joke. But Cliff Young insisted, no, he wants to enter the race. So reluctantly, they issued him a number. They pinned it upon his overalls. And he walked over with all of the other runners and all of their regalia with their sculpted bodies before the gun would get off. Runners looked at him like he was crazy. People in the crowds were snickering, looking at him. And so when the gun went off and the runners began, 547.3 mile race, foot race. Everybody began to run. The crowd was cheering, and they would run in the style of those sculpted bodies that they had, but not Cliff Young. When Cliff Young began to run, he had an odd, goofy-looking shuffle, and he began to run. And the other runners kind of left him in the dust, and there was Cliff Young, and he was shuffling along. And people were laughing. The crowd was laughing. And someone in the crowd called out, Get that old fool off the track. Five days, 15 hours, and four minutes later, across the finish line came shuffling Cliff Young. And he won the ultra marathon. And when he won, all of Australia was stunned. And the media went crazy. And crowds went crazy. And he was mobbed at the finish line. And there were people who were wanting to interview him. And they were ripping off his knapsack to discover what kind of secret food did he eat that allowed him to do this. And they were wondering what special drink did he have that would allow him to do this. And then it was discovered. Cliff Young won that race. Not by a minute, not by an hour. The nearest runner, nearest runner, was nine hours and 56 minutes behind him. He set a new world record in the ultra marathon. And then it was discovered how he did it. Being an amateur, nobody ever told Cliff Young that when you run in the ultra marathon, you run for 18 hours straight. And then you stop, and you rest and sleep for six hours. And then you get up and you run another 18 hours straight without stopping. And Cliff Young didn't know that. Nobody ever told that to Cliff Young. Cliff Young shuffled his way five days, 15 hours and four minutes without sleep. And he won the ultra marathon. Scripture says the race is not always to the swift, nor is it always to the strong. The race is to him or to her who is faithful to God and endures. Therefore, what God is saying to you and me today, let us run with endurance this race that is set before us We have no time to enter into spiritual slumber. As Paul said to the church at Rome, Awake! Arise, O sleeper, Paul says in Romans, and get up, dress up, clean up, and move out and do something for Christ. This is what God's calling you to do. This is what God's calling our church to do. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Endurance is the key. Don't quit. Don't give up. Endure. No matter what. Well, but preacher, you don't understand. I got a call from the doctor. Endure. Well, preacher, you don't understand. I know. Endure. 
We don't quit, we don't stop, we keep on keeping on. That's the meaning of the Greek word endurance. It means to bear under even when carrying a heavy load. You just keep going, you don't quit. This is what we do. Traveling light. We run the race with endurance. And then number three. The author said there's the third way you go about running. It's found in verse 2. And here it is, third participial clause. You run with endurance the race, watch it, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. In 2020, where are your eyes? They shouldn't be on a church. They certainly shouldn't be on an interim pastor. They shouldn't be on a Sunday school teacher or a staff member or anybody else. Where should our eyes be in 2020? The author of Hebrews says our eyes must be fixed on Jesus. You never win a race if you get your eyes off the goal. Get your eyes off the goal, you lose the race. We must keep our eyes on the goal. If you want to be discouraged, look at others. If you want to be downhearted, look at yourself. But if you want to be encouraged and challenged, then look at Jesus. He will never fail you. He will never disappoint you. Listen, pastors will disappoint you. Deacons will disappoint you. Staff members, because they're human like everybody else, will disappoint you. Church members will disappoint you. Family will disappoint you. Friends will disappoint you. You will be let down if you look at somebody and put that person on a pedestal long enough at somewhere Along the line, you'll discover they have feet of clay. You'll be disappointed. But if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you'll never be disappointed. He will never let you down. He will never disappoint you. He will always keep you. And He will always lead you in the right way. That's why the author says to our church today, 2020, here it is, traveling light, run that race with endurance, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Why Jesus? Well, the author says because he is the source and the perfecter of faith. He's the Alpha and Omega. And by the way, when the Bible says he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, when it says he's the source and the one who perfects, what that means is he's not only the one who kicks it off, he's not only the one who ends it, he's everything in between as well. Every step of the way, you need Jesus. You don't need me. But you do need Jesus. Each of us needs Him every step of the way. And He promises, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Every step of the way, He is with us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the source and the perfecter of our faith. Now, why is He the source and perfecter? And why do we keep our eyes fixed on Him? Look at it. Because, notice what He says, For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. Well, there's the word endured again. Look at what he endured, far more than you will ever have to endure. He endured the cross. What are you enduring today? What are your pains, struggles, difficulties, problems, temptations, trials that you are dealing with? What is it you are called on to bear for the Lord today? What are you enduring? I'll tell you this, whatever you're enduring, it's not a cross where Jesus paid the penalty for your sins, mine, and everybody else in the entire world, past, present, and future. Whatever you're enduring, it's not that. And yet when He came to the cross, He stayed true to the mission. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. He could have called 10,000 angels, as the hymn writer says, but he died alone for you and me. He endured. And notice he did it for the joy set before him. Notice the race is lying before us. Notice in the text the joy is lying before him. It's the exact same phrase in Greek. You say, David, enlighten me. What is the joy lying before Jesus that caused him to endure? (laughs) Well, take a look around and take a look at yourself. You are that joy. The joy that he's referring to there is the joy of knowing that there would be myriads of human beings, men and women, lost in their sin, headed toward hell, but who because of his sacrifice and because of their faith in Christ would be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You are are his joy. 
that lay before him, and therefore he endured the cross, despising the shame of the cross. And look at this. Three days later, there was an empty tomb. The stone was rolled away, and look at what he did. He ascended to heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't you make any mistakes in the early part of 2020 about who's in control. Don't you make any mistake. Iran is not in control. Iraq is not in control. Egypt's not in control. Israel's not in control. The United States is not in control. The president is not in control. The American military, as wonderful as she is, they are not in control. Let me tell you who's in control. It's the one who reigns at the right hand of God. His name is Jesus. That's who is in control. He never has lost control of his world. He permits sinful men to do certain things, but he reigns from heaven. He's sovereign over this universe. He's sovereign over world affairs. And one day, in a riding on the white horse, he will return and make all things right. And that's the promise of Scripture, Old and New Testament. But until that day, he reigns at the right hand of the throne of God. So your race today is worth it. Your trek in the Christian's marathon is worth it because he said it's worth it. And you know one of the things I love about Jesus? I mean, there's so many, but you know what one is? He never asked me to do anything that he himself is not, has not already done. He tells me to run with endurance. Guess what? He endured. He endured. He entered his public ministry. Satan tempted him in the Mount of Temptation behind Jericho, but he endured. Some of early followers who walked with him suddenly turned back, and in sorrow Jesus said to his disciples, Now are you two going to leave me? And in the midst of all of that, he endured. Members of his own family did not understand. In fact, in Mark's gospel, the word crazy, out of your mind, insane, is used that some of his family thought Jesus was insane to make some of the claims that he made being God in human flesh. Yet he endured. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious heat, attacked him, tried to trick him, made plans to destroy him. Yet in the midst of it all, he endured. His own disciples faltered left and right, yet he endured. Judas betrayed him with a kiss, yet he endured. Peter denied three times that he ever knew him, yet he endured. He went through the trial before Pilate, Herod back to Pilate. He endured the scourging with the Roman cat of nine tails. He endured carrying that cross down Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, to a place called Calvary. And he endured being lifted high on the cross, dropped into that hole, hanging, having been nailed to that cross. He endured. And all of the sneering of the people, if you're the Son of God, you come down. Show us. Prove it. He endured. And finally, he yielded up his own life because you do not take life from the prince of life. And he yielded up his own life for you and me on the cross when he made atonement for our sins. He endured. He went into the tomb, and three days later, he arose. He arose up from the grave. He arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose the victor of the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah, Christ arose. And he reigns at the right hand of the throne of God. So the author concludes with verse 3. For consider him, consider Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and give up. There's a lot in life to make you grow weary. You students don't feel that yet. When I was a student in high school, when I was a young man in college, I was on top of the world. I thought I could do anything, be anything. 
I felt young, I felt strong. But as the years have gone by, I have experienced things that caused me to grow weary. But in the midst of whatever I've experienced, and it's certainly been far less than some of you have experienced, in your life, I have never given up, not because of who I am, but because of who He is. And that's why we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't put your eyes on a spouse. Don't put your eyes on your children. Don't put your eyes on any member of your family. Don't put your eyes on a church staff or a pastor, an interim pastor now or one to come in the future. Don't put your eyes on any of those people. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus who endured and you'll never grow weary and you'll never lose heart. This is the message God has for us today from His Word for Sunnyvale Baptist Church. This is the Word of the Lord. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, Jesus is the author of your faith. Jesus is the one who paid the penalty for your sin. Jesus is the person of God's plan of salvation. His death on the cross as a substitute for you, paying the penalty for your sin. And now Jesus and the church, this church, calls upon you to respond to that gospel by faith. And you must believe in Christ. It's not enough just to know about Him. You've got to trust Him. You've got to put your faith in Him. You've got to turn from your sin and by faith follow the Lord Jesus. And wherever you are in this building or listening to my voice on the internet, I'm calling on you today. Come to Christ. I'm pleading with you today. Come to Jesus. Become His follower. Come and experience His salvation. Turn from your sin. By faith, come to Christ. In a moment when I pray, and we have this time of response and invitation, our staff will be here, our counselors are here, and wherever you are coming to Christ, you come, take their hand, let us pray with you, let us counsel with you, let us lead you to Jesus. Some of you are already a Christian. You're a new believer. You need to make that public. You need to follow the Lord in baptism and church membership. And whether that's here, that's up to you, whether that's in this church. But you need to come and follow Christ. And the Lord is leading some of you to join this church and to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Or maybe just to come as a new member, you're already uh, baptized. But you need to come and get involved in a local church in 2020. Where would that be? For some of you, that'll be right here. God has to lead you to the church. There are many churches but you need to find and go where God leads you to go. Undoubtedly for some, God will lead you here to serve in this place. We welcome you and invite you to come. Number three, you're a Christian, you're a member of this church. Traveling light is what it's all about. This will be our goal. This will be everything that I, your staff, and your deacons will be moving forward to in 2020. It will, they'll, we'll accomplish many things this year, but traveling light's how we're going to do it because we're going to run this race keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Join us in that commitment today.